opening. All right, we're off to a <clears throat> decent start. But now we gotta crew up, build our elite squad so I can get my son back. And that's exactly what we'll do. It's draft day. Did it work? And then some. You won't be needing those hills anymore. Peggy? Wow. I'd call this an absolute success. Hey, Aaron. Chocolate mousse. I can't talk too long. I gotta poo. This Organized Chaos podcast is brought to you by Gems Art Studio. Gems Art Studio is an online store that allows access to prints that you can use for most anything, obviously as just a picture, or as a wallpaper, or as a bookmark, or anything you can think of. You can find Gems Art Studio at etsy.com slash shop slash Gems Art Studio. This podcast is also brought to you by listeners like you. Thank you. Appreciating great trash comes from the mind of the man who did it all for the nookie, Fred Durst. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, Fred Durst's 2019 written and directed film, The Fanatic. Uh, the story talks about tells the tale of a celebrity obsessed man living in Los Angeles, Hollywood, to be exact. Uh, the man Moose, John Travolta. He uh, is obsessed with autographs and movies and all things Hollywood. He's just kind of a really, I don't know, Travolta took an interesting take in it and, and how he portrayed the character. But he was very, he was, he's obsessed with one actor in particular, a, uh, an actor by the name of Hunter Daniels, or Hunter Dunbar, played by Devin Sawa. He's at a meeting, he's at a meet and greet where Hunter's there, and he's in line to get a signing from him, and he kind of feels slight because uh, he didn't pick up on some social cues from a uh, hunter friend, uh, Leah. I couldn't find a picture of her, so we don't have one to read. Okay. I was about to say, wait, is there one that? <laughs> yeah, no, I could, they had stills of everybody but her. I thought it was weird. That is weird. She's a big yeah. part. Yeah. She is, yeah. That's kind of criminal. Ray. Moose goes to work as a street performing uh, entertainer in a policeman's bobby outfit. That's kind of what he does to earn money. So he's out there kind of doing a policeman shuffle, fake talking in a bad accent. He sees some other uh, peddlers on there. They are doing a fake magic show. And while well, one's doing that, he, his, other, his buddy's going around p- picking the pockets of a tourist, which is kind of crappy. But uh, anyways, Musa finds, or Leah tells Moose about an event where, you know, Hunter might be. So he tries to go, go and meet her there. Or meet him, meet Hunter. He ends up causing a scene and getting kicked out. <laughs> and she ends up telling him about the Star Map app, which will tell you exactly where celebrities live. Something for someone who is, as we've seen so far in the film, as uh, I would say, unhinged as uh, Moose is. Oh, he seems fine to me. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, Walter took an interesting take with the portrayal, I think. Like, this is just me, and I'm just going to side diverge on this a little to me he kind of almost played it like he had some sort of like mental deficiency like oh, maybe slightly autistic i absolutely assumed he was supposed to it's never established in the movie but i yeah. assume there's something wrong with him like it's more there's... than just i'm a really big fan because yeah i'm a really big fan of a lot of things i'm nowhere near this i'm <laughs> not yeah no i mean and i mean i i could spout off the facts like just like that but I mean, I have those cues. I know when's an appropriate time and when isn't an appropriate time. Yes. Mm. This is like, yeah, the Travolta did something, or maybe Fred gave him a certain direction with the character. But I mean, I know that I, I believe I read something that Fred had a stalker issue, and maybe Travolta as well in the nineties. I actually meant to look that up and see if there's like a history here. So I mean, like if they if they you know drew from that experience for the for the performance, then you know, okay, people are fucking weird. <laughs> nah, yeah, and he is very weird in this movie. Anyways, mm. yeah. So where? Let me see here. So ah, yes, the Star Map app. Yes. Yes. 
he goes and gets it. Uh, he goes and sees different celebrities' houses. He calls Leah. He's over the moon, excited, like, oh, my God, this is the greatest thing. Sounds like he's about ready to have his heart's ready to explode as he's running around their tiny apartment. Next day, we go back to him at work and he's doing his policeman Bobby thing where the other where the uh, extreme Chris Angel guy there. They get into a con like a confrontation and it gets a little heated. And yes, he runs into him the next day and he chokes the shit out of him. Doesn't kill him, just scares the bejesus. And this is about the time in the movie where where it takes a bit of a turn. I, I oh, actually no, I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself. I, he actually goes to Hunter's house because of the Star Map app to deliver a letter to him, telling him how he feels, like how unhappy he was with how that ends. He signs it. I, it makes it seem like he stabs him with the pen. Well, that's one of the just... weird things. The the music and sounds in this movie are super fucking intense. Like yeah, it's like he he holds his back. And he hits him with the pen, and there's a sound like, boom! And you make him think he has, like, a pen. He's, like, stabbing him! And then you just see he writes but, down the shirt. And it's like, what is up with that fucking sound? Dude, that's not how you, hit, that's not how you edit that shit. <laughs> no, but it, it was an interesting choice, and it, it, I think it worked. I think it worked. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, after this, he runs into the extreme Chris bro, and uh, he chokes him. A security guard we see earlier who told him, who told Moose he needs to stand up for himself more, he does. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't really care. Moose starts freaking out, and this is where one of the signs, I think, like where he starts acting like a, a kid, like a very small child when they're caught doing something wrong, apologizing profusely, all that. Like, that's when I kind of thought, like, he's not all there He's not all with it. Something's something's up. So Moose goes and uh, he goes back to Hunter's house to try and leave the note. He gets scared off by a maid. He goes and tell he goes home, tells Leah that he did this. Leah tells him never go back there again. So the next day, Moose goes right back there. He gets scared by the maid, who tells him, you know, who tries to shoo him off. He pushes her. She falls into a water. Like a, is a fountain? Yeah, a water fountain. Breaks her neck and dies. Or we're presuming she's dead or knocked out, but she's just there. I want to jump back to that, because I'm pretty sure she's supposed to be dead. And I feel like they come back to it at the very end. They do. But, like, she was laying there for at least a day, right? I'm really confused by that. I'm really yeah, that's that that's that's definitely a, a plot hole that I, I I still find a little off with it. So like so she's been laying there for but it makes sense because later in that movie where we find that out, you know, he goes to open the door and he sees the police there with the man we're presuming would probably be her husband. And you know, you just see him point and look like, Yeah, that's him. Mm -hmm. That's her boss. Yeah. Yeah. But he also, there is a line of dialogue where he did say, uh, or Devin Sawa's character did say that, you know, he, he did it again. He kissed the maid. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but, all right, let's see here, yeah. So, after uh, this encounter with the maid, so he's already on Hunter's property, so he's 10 pounds of shit. <laughs> like, he's over the moon, excited. Running around, looking at everything, just getting getting all excited. <laughs> and then Hunter comes home, so you see him hide. He hides underneath the kid, his, uh, Hunter's kid's bed, where later, you know, the kid goes to bed, he goes to sleep. Hunter falls asleep in the living room. You, you see Moose crawl up from under the bed, stand in the living room right over him, and he sits down in the chair. And, yeah, this, this scene in particular is really weird because we see him just rocking back and forth. Mm -hmm. Moving his legs, just just acting kind of creepy, like really creepy. Well, the, I think the creepiest bit is like he gets like in his face a couple times, and yeah, he cuddles with him. Yes, and Hunter must be an intensely thick sleeper. I mean, holy Seriously. shit! Oh my. Yeah. Oh god. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. All right, so. After this, you know, 
he goes back and apparently this whole time, cause we see him taking pictures of a sleeping hunter, you know, Leah confronts him again mm-hmm. about it. It's like, you didn't listen to me. And if you're going to do that, don't fucking broadcast it on social media. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is just like, wow, of course he did. <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> yeah. So again, what does Moose do the third time? Goes back. Only this time, we see Hunter taped and bound to the bed. Yeah, he goes a full misery on him, I like to say. Hmm. Yeah, he does. He goes full... I wrote he goes full basic instinct. Okay. Uh. Minus the intercourse. Yeah. So full misery. So... <laughs> oh, it, it was also on in the background. Yeah. That will do it. Too, I was man. watching it on my laptop. <laughs> You weren't fully committed, uh, man? You weren't... No, no. I just had HBO on, and I was watching it on my laptop when I was writing. <laughs> I just happened to look up go, yeah. oh! So that's happening. Cool. Newman's <laughs> a pervert. <laughs> so, yeah, he's taped up, and, you know, of course, he freaks the fuck out when he wakes up bound to his bed. I mean... At, as I would, but he wakes up because he sees him lying dead. He sees what he believes is Moose lying dead with a bunch of fake blood pouring That's from right. his head. I forgot so about that. Like, yeah, it looks like he shot himself. And he's just saying, you stupid fuck. You dumb fucking fan. God damn. Then he wakes up. Oh, I fooled you. I'm as good of an actor. As good of one of you as you. And here's where we really see Moose become so unhinged that it's just, it's, it's cringy. Yes. There, there's but, a lot of that with Moose. <laughs> there's a lot, but there's also a lot of gold, and I will get to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, you, see, you see Moose run away, and, you know, he, Devin saw was freaking the fuck out. He comes back in, full blue overall jumpsuit. Jason fans, you're nothing without us. You're nothing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's, he's crazy, so Hunter just w- wants to calm him down and get him out of his house, say, we'll sign everything, I'll do whatever, you know, whatever. And he convinces Moose to let him go. For That's he right. sues him to calm down so much to where Hunter being like completely restrained like this, gets Moose's head to rest right here. And he gets him to undo one, one uh, wrist strap. Hunter's like, yeah, man, we're going to do all this. He undoes another, looks at him dead in the eye, and is just like, it's going to be okay, buddy. It's going to be okay. Pulls a shotgun, shoots him right in the fucking hand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That gets really weird, too, because I'm like, okay, I I get it when, like, if you just want to kill him, I get it. If you just want to scare him, I get it, but he does some fucked up shit. He doesn't... Yeah, he completely blows off all of his fingers on yeah. one hand. Yeah, most of his hand, it seems like. Yeah, Most of his hand, stones. yeah. Not the best prosthetic, he by the way. <laughs> definitely makes him deaf in both ears, because he fires it, like, right next to both ears. Mm-hmm. And I think he clips it in the first shot. Oh, and he stabs him in the fucking eye with a knife. Which, again, looked weird, because, like, wait, he survived that? Like, it's like this really... Like, it looks like he just stabs him through the eye. And I guess he does, but just... I guess it's just in the eye, but that's it. To me, it just looked like he was popping a balloon, like... Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So, Moose shuffles back to Hollywood. Hollywood Boulevard. And Sunset Strip, a bloody, bloody mess. Some tourists come up to him, think like, oh, dude, this is look awesome, man. Let's get some selfies with them. But Moose still stops and, and, po- and poses for the photo. Yes. I did, I did notice yeah, that, and I thought that was a little weird. Yeah, I guess he kind of becomes a celebrity now, which, uh... Yeah. Okay. And okay. he ends with Hunter still sitting in his, like, kitchen floor, just shocked at everything he had just done. You know, the foul, evil deed and everything that took place. There's a knock on the door. It's the police. They're asking questions about the maid. And Hunter gets arrested for the murder of the maid. Yes. And Moose is off free to exist. Yes, and then uh, after the credits play, we have Nick Fury pop up, and he recruits Moose into the Avengers. Uh... (laughs) No, this... Yeah, this... I, it, want I think it's oh, go ahead. it's surprising. It took some chances, and it went with it. Well, 
This movie, I, I want to kind of go into the history because I, I heard about it probably the same time you did. It really made the circuit as far as like the internet uh, blowing up about, oh my god, this is the new uh, best bad movie. And I, <laughs> I definitely see, I'm not sure, like I, I think you definitely enjoyed it more than I did. I am really not 100% sure my full thoughts. Maybe if I watch it more, because there are exactly two aspects of this movie that I could see really, like, growing on me that are just kind of ridiculous. <laughs> and that is Travolta's performance and the music. And I'm yep. not even getting to the, to the point where Hunter is with his kid, and he's like, have you heard Limp Biscuit? Limp Biscuit is the best band ever. It's wonderful. I love Limp Biscuit. Like, no, holy shit. I, I'm pretty sure we draw it up, but this is directed by Fred Durst and written by Fred Durst. Dude. Yes. It, dude, come on. <laughs> yes, it was. But if you remember, like, Sawa was, I, he was in a few of their music videos, I think, back in the day. I know he was in Break Stuff. Yeah, sure. But you don't name drop yourself in a movie like this. Get a grip, man. Yes, you, yes, well, you do. Well, yeah, I guess apparently you, you do. Okay. <laughs> okay. I want to say it was uh, the second Halloween film that Rob Zombie did. Oh, I barely remember. I remember the first half hour of that was a fucking dream. It pissed me off. And I was just like, uh, done with that movie yeah, yeah. after that. No. Halloween 2. No. Not the first one. Not the first one, how like most of it was just a ham fisted uh, story for story. Yeah. <laughs> The second one with the fucking white knight and the fucking bullshit. Oh, God. Mm. Yeah. Hobo <laughs> fucking Michael and that monstrosity shit. <laughs> like, I think, like, my, I'm so mad about that sequel, I've lost my point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Halloween. There's an argument to be made that Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 is the it. worst. I remember. Yeah, I remember. Uh, one of the scenes where Lori goes to her friends before they dress in the Rocky Horror outfits. That's right. I'm almost positive there is a fucking white zombie poster in that room. Oh, there might be. I'm, and it's just kind of like, or maybe in the record store, but it's still just come the fuck on. This, I, I know this is a tangent, but when it comes to Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, like, they do almost a remake of the second Halloween during the first half hour. The first half hour of that fucking movie is like a remake of Halloween 2. And then it's all a fucking dream. And it pisses me off so much that it the rest of the movie could have been gold. I'm just pissed at it at that point. I, I, I must have blacked that out. <laughs> it was like, or you must have gotten to just so, that. You... I mean, if anything, I would have expected the hospital shit from Halloween 2 to happen at the tail end of Rob Zombie's first Halloween. The fucking length and the rate that film was going. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> anyways. I, I digress. <laughs> anyways. Um... The, I felt this movie, it's a sleeper hit in that aspect. You know, it had plenty of suspense, plenty of tension in the film, and they hit all the cues right with the score. They All of that was good. But, I mean, like, he did seem a lot like a stalker, which he proudly claimed that he wasn't many times through the film. Yes. As a general rule, but, um, when you have to say constantly, I'm not a stalker, it means you're totally a stalker. Just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Tywin Lannister put it best. Any man who proclaims to be the king is indeed not a king. Yes. <laughs> the Lannisters may have been pricks, but Tywin, he knew his shit was amazing. Sawa, I think he gave a great performance as well. I mean, I believed him to be a fucking piece of shit celebrity. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, and I follow the guy on Twitter, and what I can follow from that is, like, he's fucking far from it. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He just seems like a genuine dude. Yeah, well, like, I've seen hope. I've seen various photos of of him like with his kids and his kids holding N sixty four controllers and like the golden ice screen and he's like, should I destroy them? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I think yes is the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. I think like for me, when I watch it, I just I guess I just didn't enjoy it as much as I should have. <laughs> well, I'm also a big fan of Devin Sawa too. Mm -hmm. Like, I love Idle Hands. I really enjoyed it. the no. first Final Destination. <laughs> That's been a while. That was kind of crazy, though. I get behind that. Mm. But, I mean, I'm just maybe just, like, a, a, already a fan, and he is one of my favorite parts in uh, 
next week. So, well, it's not really trash cinema, mm. but well, nah, I'll, I'll, I'll scrap. But he's a also one of my favorite parts in one of my favorite films from the '90s, which is SLC Punk. Okay. Mm. He plays a real bit part in that, and they also had like what is now being dubbed as the legacy sequel, and he also was one of the original returning cast members to that. Oh. the legacy sequel to SLC Punk. Go yeah, into more stuff a, I haven't seen. John Maud or uh, Frank. <laughs> and uh, another character uh, who is pretty much like, I think the main acting that other guy does now is like leads on Broadway. <laughs> the... I think it's Adam Pascal. Okay. But yeah. That's his name. I... But yeah, um... Yeah, I don't think that there really is that bad of a performance in this movie. Yeah, I think John DeVolta, almost the way he handles it, that I could see comedy in that. In fact, there was quite yeah. a few moments that had me chuckling. Well, him walking into the bar and ordering the strawberry milkshake is fucking hilarious. Yeah, well... <laughs> yeah, it's... I don't, like, here's the deal. I almost feel like Fred Durst might be capable of making a good movie. I feel like yeah. I feel like he has enough talent. Well, yeah, I mean, he has direct there. According to IMDb, he has 41 directing credits to his name. Holy shit. Two Maybe. of which are feature length films. The rest are either being shorts or music videos. OK, so just two films. One directing credits. So <laughs> because there's lots of things like lighting, it's fine. Um, performances are largely fine. Travolta yeah. is kind of off the rails. He, but then again, I don't know what you do with Travolta. If you have Travolta in your movie, you just kind of say, hey, do your thing. Yeah, well, I mean, like, can you tell Nick Cage how to Nick Cage? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I guess, like... I mean, I hate to like look, always lump those two together because of Face Off, but they really work well. They're both, like, actors in very similar ways. Like, they're yeah. great and... Yeah. I would like, probably... They, I, I was just going to say, I probably appreciate Nick Cage more because I swear to God, he bounces between unbelievably bad and just brilliant, like seamlessly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like Willy's Wonderland. Or, yeah, like, he, I'm trying to think of a real, I know there was that one movie. Uh, adaptation wasn't that great. I like Adaptation. I, I thought he did a good job in that one. The uh, Wicker Man. Wicker he is Man. so okay, yeah, bad in yeah. Wicker Man. But then he does something I mean, like I, Bad Lieutenant, where he's fucking brilliant. I mean, I liked Adaptation. I just think that it, it had a rough translation to the screen. Ah. You know, I kind of thought that story would be better told as a book than a movie. Last time I saw that movie, I was uh, happily married. So that was a while ago for me. So. Okay. okay. <laughs> Fun fact, I'm not. <laughs> but yes. Um, this is... I my feeling towards fanatic are really weird. Um, I I really do not like it, but I don't <laughs> think it is entertainingly bad. I think it skirts it almost frustratingly because there are times where John Volta says something just off the wall crazy, but then there's like this super intense music beat, and it almost put like it almost like makes me laugh, and the music beat pushes that laugh away. I almost feel like. And yeah. I do, like, I could cut together this movie and make it a lot funnier. I could say that. Uh, <laughs> and maybe the music beats were uh, Fred Durst in the editing room trying to make it more serious because he realized how goofy his performance was. Yeah. Maybe. Hold on. Mm. I'm going to find it. I, I remember the other movie that he directed. It was shocking. And it was one that I I kind of was like, wait, holy holy shit, really? Okay, was the movie called Shocking, or were you just shocked to figure out what it was? I was shocked. Okay. What it was. <laughs> I was like, wait, he did a movie called Shocking? <laughs> well, I mean... He did Space Jam. <laughs> no. Well, while you're looking that up, I want to tell you the one funny joke in Space Jam that I forgot to talk about. There's literally yeah. one good moment in Space Jam. Actually, hold oh. that thought. I will be right back. Okay. 
Or you could just... Well, I'm going to tell the audience then. Or we could or... sit in silence. But anyways, the best joke in Space Jam, I'm going to spoil it for you right now so you don't have to actually fucking watch that movie. Uh, Sylvester, they're in a halftime. And Sylvester comes in and says, Hey, guys, you know who's in the audience? Michael Jordan. And in my mind, this is like the perfect time because they're down. It's a perfect time for a little cameo for Michael Jordan to walk in and say, Hey, dude, I've been in your shoes. You just got hanged together. You got this. You know, he gives this little inspirational cameo, and then they can go out there and win. And it feels like the perfect time in the movie for that. And then in walks Michael B. Jordan. And it's like, it's actually Michael B. Jordan in this fucking movie. And it's kind of hilarious. And it was the one funny moment in the movie. And Michael B. Jordan's like, hey, why do you want me here? Well, I have nothing to do with this. Oh, uh, but that, yeah. that was the best moment in Space Jam 2. Bobby Quarters is back. What, what do we got? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I very unprofessionally didn't use the bathroom before we started recording. Oh, you see, I did. I got a poo. Yeah. I got... <laughs> you should have walked away and said, I got a poo. Come on. When else do you get a perfect moment for that? I <laughs> I just, uh, yeah, I just had to rock a piss and just didn't have time to address it. <laughs> the, <Yeah. levy> had... <laughs> the movie that he also directed was the 2008 family film The Long Shots, starring Ice Cube. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that was sure. like, oh, okay. It's a I youth always... movie. It's a kid movie about, like, uh, sports. I think football... And, uh, yeah, yeah, a true story of Jasmine Plummer, who, at the age of 11, became the first female to play in the Pop Warner football tournament in its 56-year history. I've always wanted the Lip Biscuit family movie. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> I, I, I think it would be an interesting family film if they made a family film based off their song, All in the Family. You see, I'm not familiar enough with them to... to know that <laughs> I, I i'm showing off the fact that i have no limp biscuit cred there's there's you you name some really famous ones yeah I'll i'm remember, feeling but... yeah i'm feeling really shameful right now <laughs> hey according to this movie limp biscuit was like the best band ever so well, i think yes. i'm the one that's out i think i'm well, that's high praise, even coming from the writer yeah i mean the writer clearly thinks a lot of limp biscuit so what do and I the know? Was good, so he kept it in the film. <laughs> but yes, that that was uh, that was fanatic. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. It's yeah, it's a but weird I, one. I did discover this around the same time when it was coming out, and I was, I mean, I was interested that Fred Durst was directing a horror film, and I'm just like, okay, mm -hmm. I'll. I'll give it a fair shot. Yeah. And for, um, for what it's worth, I've seen worst made movies. He has, yeah. I, you know, I'm probably going to regret this, but I'm going to go ahead and say he has a good movie in him. Will yeah. we ever see it? Probably not. But probably not. There is the potential. He, there is... The potential is definitely there. Now, I had, I actually just mail ordered for a movie and. I already kind of spoiled it a little bit, warning. But I was going to show you this clip and see if you are, you'll know it, if you are interested in doing this movie next. Fujiyama? Yes, I am. Who are you? I'm a cop. For the wall. What do you think? <laughs> what do you think? It's been a while since I've seen that. It's but, been a while um... since I've seen it, too. But I remember just loving that shit. Loving that. I remember it being amazing, and I know that Tommy Wiseau was in the second or the sequel. That's right. I was also interested in checking out the sequel, and this would give me an excuse because I have not seen the sequel either. And not either. We got to do them in order. We can't just jump around the Samurai Cops. Uh, oh, I spoiled True. it. You didn't say the title. Samurai Cop. <laughs> Damn it! You knew. <laughs> <laughs> I said I knew instantly what that was the I believe, when you first showed it. I'm certain. Yes. It, <laughs> Well, I thought that clip was kind of... I guess it's not obvious if you haven't seen it, but if you've seen it, it's like, oh, yes. It's oh, kind yeah. of more if you know, you know, I yeah. think. I thought about doing well, something more obscure, like I thought about this scene where they're running down the steps, and it's like the same voice keeps on talking to him. Hey, what are you doing? 
hey, what are you doing? It's like 50 different people, but it's all the same yeah. fucking voice. It's, it's almost the same as uh, that Mystery Science Theater episode he got, where, you know, they're about to walk out into the desert, and just out of nowhere, this voice just says, hey, right, watch out for snakes. Nah. <laughs> It's like, who said that? ADR work is brilliant. It's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. All right. So are you yes. up for Samurai Cop next week? Yeah, yeah. All right. We can do that. I'm using a microphone. Woo! Mm. I want to go ahead and add some audio credits at the end here. Uh, the theme music you're hearing at the beginning and end of this podcast was uh, written and performed by George Johnson, a very good friend of mine. And my current Patreons are uh, Fel Martins, David Lara, and Lindsay Painkhurst. If you'd like to become a patron, go ahead and follow the link down below. Anything you can provide would be incredibly helpful to this channel. We're barely limping by right now. Uh, I'd love to make this my full-time job. I'm miles away from